invite you to turn to the book of Joshua, chapter 10, reading and you're hearing verses 12 through 14. Joshua, chapter 10, verses 12 through 14. When you have it, say amen. Verse 12 says, Then spake Joshua to the Lord in the day when the Lord de delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel. And he said in the sight of Israel, Son, stand thou still upon Gibeon, and moon in the valley of Ejelon. And the sun stood still, and the moon stayed until the people had avenged themselves upon their enemies. Is this not written in the book of Jasher? So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven and hastened not to go down about a whole day. And there was no day like that before it or after it that the Lord hearkened unto the voice of a man for the Lord fought for Israel. What a word. Subject this afternoon for consideration, a God move, a God move. Let us pray. Father, now take lips of clay, I pray. Speak a word to us today. Spirit of the living God, have your way. We pray in Jesus' name. Let God's people say, amen. You may be seated. Amen. I just feel like worshiping God, you know. I feel like praising him. God is a good God. What do you say? Our conference is praying to God for a breakthrough. We are praying for God to move in our midst and to intervene and arrest our challenges that impede the work of God. Now, we know that God's work is depending on the success of every member. After all, the conference is made up of the membership of all the churches. For the conference does not generate money, but it operates on the faithfulness of the members who return tithe systematically. The ABC does not prosper by osmosis. It is sustained by the support of those who shop there to buy truth-filled literature for their own spiritual growth and for the edification of those that we hope to see in the kingdom of God. Can I get a witness? The school doesn't birth children. It ministers to the children that you and I send there because we believe that our children ought to be taught of the Lord and deserve a Christian education. So when we don't return tithe, the conference cannot hire sufficient pastors to cover the churches. Churches that are birthed through evangelism. When we are unfaithful to the Lord, we cannot sustain Bible instructors to teach the everlasting gospel. Now, we know that the gospel has to be taught by all of us, but thank God for gospel workers. When we don't buy food products at the ABC, Adventist Book Center, but, be, but we buy from the marketplace because it's more convenient, we're actually helping the ABC to be put out of business. We are, we are living in unprecedented times. Times that are causing conference leadership to pray for a breakthrough. For if the way things continue to go, we're going to either have a breakdown, a break up, or we're going to have to trust God for a breakthrough. In the midst of these trying times, I came here to remind you, however, that there is no obstacle that God cannot remove if we put our trust in him. Somebody ought to say amen. amen. And that truth is never more evident than in our text for today. Where we find Joshua in chapter 10, desirous of doing God's will, but is confronted with a challenge beyond his ability to handle. And so he needs God to come through for him to meet a need that is unprecedented. 
I think you and I can relate to this story because all of us are perhaps facing things that we've never encountered before. We too have come to a time in our lives where we need God like never before. Can I get a witness? The truth of the matter is we are all facing problems, challenges, and conundrums that you and I cannot solve without God's help. In spite of our smiles and hugs and handshakes, there are people here today that are fighting real battles in life. Somebody is going through a storm today. Somebody is perhaps climbing up the rough side of the mountain. For some people, you are in a rock, between a rock and a hard place. For some of you, you're about to quit and give up. And that's why you need to know that God can bring you through your storm. Can I get a witness? Now, a breakthrough is a supernatural move of God. Something to move out of the way that which the devil has placed in your way to, to impede your progress. We need to believe today that there is no problem that God cannot solve. And like First Lady said, there is nothing too hard for the Lord. We need to understand that there is no relationship that he cannot heal. There is nothing he cannot remedy. There is no area he cannot reconcile. No weakness he cannot empower. No sickness he cannot cure. No habit he cannot overcome. Because all things with God are possible. We should never despair because rightly understood, obstacles are simply opportunities for God to break through with a victory. So no matter what you're going through today, you have the option of choosing God to deal with your situation to give you love, healing, and power. In our text, Joshua finds himself between a rock and a hard place. And yet God meets his need by an unprecedented demonstration of supernatural power. So incredible that the record says that there has not been a day like it before it and neither shall there be a day like it after it. What an unprecedented move of God. The record says that God caused the sun to stand still. That's some power. What do you say? God literally suspended the laws of nature and acts so extraordinary that by itself, it's reason for us to contemplate it for the rest of the day. However, as you study the text, the sun stood still by a miracle of God, but there was a man who prayed for that miracle. Now, you and I believe that God can perform miracles. Can I get a witness? Christians believe in the Bible. And from the Bible perspective, its miracles are not unusual occurrences for God. I mean, you're talking about someone who spake and it was done. Who commanded and it stood fast. We're talking about someone who can move in and out of human experience when he wills, how he wills, and if he wills, because he's God all by himself. So for the Christian, miracles, are, uh, uh, miracle territory is where God operates. But the awesome thing here is not just that the sun stood still, but the text says that God heeded the voice of a man. Think about that. Joshua told God, I have a need, and God said, no problem. Joshua said, Lord, I need your help, and God said, I can make a way. The real value of the narrative in this text is that God moved because he found Joshua to be a man of prayer and character. You see, when you walk through the passage, you will discover evidence as to why God was prompted to respond in such a remarkable manner. The first thing we see is that God seems to move in our favor when we become people of character. 
Joshua and the men of Israel were on a roll. The initial military kickoff of the central portions of the campaign in Canaan land had just been completed with the rousing defeat of Jericho and Ai. As Joshua is now planning the southern campaign, the word is out on God that he is moving through the army of Israel. You know, when you live for God and you're a powerful witness, people get to know that there's a God on the throne. Victory at Jericho and Ahai has caused the Gibeonites, the next targeted city, to result to deception in order to save themselves from the Jehovah-led Israelites. See, in chapter 9, it recalls an ill-fated covenant that Joshua entered into with the Gibeonites because he presumptuously signed the deceitful treaty without prayer and consultation from the Lord. It goes like this. They put on some old raggedy, moldy clothes and brought some old uh, bottles and some moldy bread and said, we've come from afar and we've heard about your God. We want to sign a treaty with you. And when Joshua asked, where are you from? They said, look at our bread. He didn't, they didn't tell Joshua where they were from. And without prayer and consultation with God, he signed a peace treaty with the Gibeonites who were the next target city on God's list. That's why you should never enter into a contract or sign the dotted line unless you have talked and prayed to God. Those of you about to enter into a marital contract, you need to talk to the Lord first. In fact, you need to increase your prayer life. Can I get a witness from married people? Those of you who are going into business, be careful who you align yourself with. Make sure that you are both anchored in the Lord. Come on and talk to me. So Joshua was deceived, and three days later, they were irate that these guys had duped them. They were afraid that Jehovah's armies was coming through. And so through deceitfulness, they got Joshua to sign the dotted line. And so now instead of writing them off, they had to deal with it and bear with them. And so trouble arose for the Gibeonites. And trouble arose for the Gibeonites because all the surrounding nations said, Hey, did you hear? The Gibeonites have signed up with the Israelites. Let's deal with them. And so when they were about to deal with the Gibeonites, they sent word to Joshua, hey, you signed up with us. Come help us. And Joshua now could have said, you know what? This is a good time to get the noose off my neck. I'm going to let them kill one another. But no, he chose to uh, keep his obligations. And as Psalms 15, 4 says, swear to his own heart. In other words, when you get into a contract and you find yourself on the losing end of the deal, it doesn't mean that you must now try to wiggle yourself out. you got to swear to your own hurt. So sometimes you get yourself into situations, you got to bear the consequences. So Joshua now picks up himself and says, listen, let me go up and fight this battle. I just want to stop here for a minute because Satan knows how to seduce us into the pitfalls of self-sufficiency. So let me just say this. Whenever we allow our self-sufficiency to seduce our clear duty or impulse to run the red light of reason or prayer to be our last resort instead of our first point of contact we make with God, we make God a divine spectator, Jesus a holy bench warmer, and put the Holy Ghost on injured reserve. You see, the real peril of prayerlessness is that it leaves God no other choice but to leave us to our own devices and face our consequences of our actions. The Gibeonite alliance with God's people precipitated a major military movement. And in chapter 10... We are told that as soon as the five surrounding confederate nations learned that the Gibeonites made a peace treaty with the enemy Israel, they decided to take them out. So now Joshua is faced with a conundrum. 
patriarchs and prophets, we are told that even though the covenant was secured by deception, it should not be disregarded. For the obligation to which one's word is pledged, if it does not bind the person to perform a wrong act, should be held sacred. No consideration of gain or revenge or self-interest can in any way affect the sacredness of an oath or pledge. That covenant, as ill-conceived and ill-advised as it had been, was signed by, jo by Joshua in Jehovah's name. And so Joshua felt obligated because in God's name, he'd made a deal. And now he, he, he may want to go back on it, but God's name is out there. And so not because he likes the Gibeonites, he loves God. And to honor God, he keeps, keeps his commitments. That's why those of us who do business with people ought to do business right. You call yourself Christian, you ought to make sure that your business dealings are above board. Can I get a witness, anybody? People ought not be looking for you for their money. When we bear his name, we ought to do things right. And if anybody suffers loss, it ought to be us. We should take the low road. What do you say? Because when we represent God right, we make a greater impact on the kingdom of God. And that's why they're looking at Adventists carefully to see whether you and I are living up to what we say we are supposed to be. So when Joshua responded to the Gibeonites, he took the profound risk. He literally forced his army a distance of 25 miles up a cliff, a 33-foot cliff at night, to face an army five times larger than his for a people that he didn't like. All because God's name was at stake. And you can only do that when you are a person of character. And that's why it's not your gifts or talents or education, not your accomplishments, not your titles, not how well you can network. Those things are fine. But that which defines you, that which defines your legacy ought to be your character. Our character is either developing or deteriorating every time we make a decision. Character development, we need to be reminded, is the number one item on God's agenda. Christ likeness produced in you is the bottom line goal of the Holy Ghost. God moved because Joshua was a man of character. For Joshua, God's agenda was big. And that's why Christians spend their time making God look big and better as a result of our commitment. Let me ask you this. How big does God look through your witness? Do people identify you with the cause of God by the way you live? Do people see Christ in you? Secondly, I believe God moves on our behalf when we do what he told us to do. If you look at verse 8, the Lord said, Do not fear them, for I have delivered them into your hands, and not a man of them shall stand before you. Animated by God's promise, Joshua led the fighting men of Israel from Gilgal up to Gibeon, and when he got there before sunrise, they ambushed the Amorite confederation in a surprised attack. The men of Israel fought with vigor and confidence because God had promised them victory. Praise God for that. And in verse 11, we are told that God himself, watch this now, God himself rained hailstones down from heaven and more Amorites died from the hailstones than they did from the swords of Israel. Because when you're fighting with the Lord, he'll fight your battles. How many of you know that human effort and divine aid can move mountains? The one that he said, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. Take my yoke upon you, drop back the load on me, and with my help, we can make it. How many of you know that you've, when you put God first, and you got up and said, God, i got so many things to do, but I don't want to take a step without you, and you put him first, your day was better because, not because you were smart, but because God helped you get through that day.
God rained down so many hailstones that he, the hailstones took out more of the enemies than Joshua's people's swords. And who knows, but that the battles that you think that you're fighting, you probably have more on your hands. Angels are probably fighting all around you all day, all night. You don't even know the half that's, 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 that has not been told. That's why when you get up in the morning and you come to church, you ought to praise God because while you're sleeping, angels were protecting you. From the angels seen and unseen. And you think, you know, it was because you're so smart and you're so righteous. God was keeping your carcass. When you were paying attention to yourself, can I get a witness? You ought to give God the glory that he works when we're not working, that he's watching you when you ain't watching out for yourself. This time, however, we notice that God intervened and gave him power and divine support. Why? Because Joshua, this time, took a request to the Lord and asked him, do I go up? He, he fell on his knees in prayer and put it before the Lord first. And God told him, go up. I'll assure you victory in verse 8. But check this. Even though God assured him victory... Joshua still had to put forth effort. In other words, he did all that human effort could do. He marshaled the army. He engaged the enemy. He developed the battle plan. He coordinated the attack. And then he relied on God to do what he could not do. Did you get it? See, there's a place for prayer to move mountains. But there's also a place for you to roll up your sleeve and fight. Are you listening to me? You see, prayer is not the elixir to all your problems. And if you only pray and do nothing else, then you are praying too much. You got to pray, but then you got to get up and go to work. Come on and say amen. Divine power must be mingled with human effort. We are co-laborers together with Christ. And I found that when you put forth your best effort, it's not your best effort that gives success, but God will honor your best effort, make up for your deficiencies with his own grace, and give you credit when you didn't deserve it. So we need to pray for souls, but we need to be good Christians and witnesses so that when people want to join your church and they come and find out you're a part of the church, they want to be here. Some of you were witnesses for Christ this week, and you don't even know it. For some of us, some people will not come to church because we're here, and you don't even know it. So God wants us to pray but he also wants us to put forth all the effort that we can make. The Amorites, you see, were trying to disrupt God's intended plan for the children of Israel. And anytime anybody or anything tries to squeeze God out of your life, you've got to fight. The Bible says we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of darkness against spiritual wickedness in high places. That's why we've got to put on the whole armor and fight. And the reason why the Bible tells you put on the whole, whole armor is because you're in a warfare. You're not going to just get to heaven by just laying around and sashay your way to heaven. If you're going to get to streets of gold, you're going to have to fight and get up and spend some time in prayer and read your Bible. You want a strong, vibrant Christian life? It's not going to just happen by coming to church 11 o'clock. What about 12 o'clock and 1 o'clock and 2 o'clock? And what about Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday? It doesn't happen just because you show up today. You want a vibrant Christian life? You got to serve him every day. You got to talk to him every day. You got to spend some time in his word. He can wake you up, but you got to read the Bible. He can give you the word, but you got to apply it. You're saved by grace, but grace will help you get going to do what God asks you to do. They go together. Pray, 
Talk to God, but make sure that you do your part. So God moves when we are people of character. God moves when we do our part, but God also moves when our goals align themselves with his purpose. If you look at verse 9, Joshua came upon them. And when you see that, Joshua has been painstakingly taking one city at a time. Watch this. Up to now, Joshua has been painstakingly taking one city at a time. But let me show you how good God is. He should not have signed the treaty. Are you with me? But because he did, God is still good when we make mistakes. Now watch how God can take this mistake and make it work for his glory. See, up to this time, he's been taking one city at a time. But now that he has signed the treaty, all the surrounding nations say, hey, let's get together and take out the Gibeonites and take out Israel. So now what Joshua realizes is that he's got an opportunity to not just take out one city, but to take them all down one time. Oh, you missed it. And so what he does, he talks to God about it. He puts it before the Lord. And God answers his prayer because his goal, his agenda is in harmony with God's purpose. God said that not a man shall stand before you. That was God's purpose. And so God, Joshua's prayer is in harmony with God's purpose. I'm trying to get you, help you to get your prayers answered. Don't bring to God things that are, that, that are not in harmony with his purpose. He's answering prayers that, are, that line themselves up with his will. That's why the model prayer says, thy will be done. That's how you pray. I'm praying that your will, not my will, your will be done. And I, I must repeat it. The first three things in the model prayer have nothing to do with what you want, but everything to do with what God wants. Hallowed be your name. You know what they're saying? When you call his name holy, it's saying that I'm willing to take on his holiness in my life. Secondly, when you say thy will be done, it's saying, listen, I want your will to be done in my life. And when you say thy kingdom come, it's saying, listen, I want you to usher in your coming and win souls and wrap this thing up so that we can go home. And none of that has anything to do with your shopping list. Everything in the first three things of that prayer have everything to do not with what you want, but with what, with, but with what God wants. And I came to ask you, is your prayer life and the prayers you're sending to God in harmony with what God wants? Otherwise, he may put your prayer in that file that, that do not answer for their own good file. Because you and I need to align ourselves with God's will. So he sees the combined forces of the southern confederate nations. He doesn't hesitate. And despite being the underdog, he knows that God, God, he knows that he is doing God's will and performing God's purpose. And whenever you and I align ourselves with God's purpose, with a greater cause than ourselves, then we are in harmony with God. We need to ask ourselves when we're praying and when we're living, what are we living for? What motivates us? What is our purpose? What is the driving force? And, and let me say this, that the cause, and the, and the, the cause that you stand for, it ought to be bigger than you. In other words, if you are your, own, if you are your biggest cause, then you've got a small cause. Because your cause ought to be bigger than you. I think it was Martin Luther King who said, except you find a reason for which you're willing to die, you're not fit to live. So the secret for the Christian is we swallow our lives up in a cause that's bigger than us. That's why our problems become small because we serve a big God and we serve a big cause. And the, the happiest people on the planet are the ones who have surrendered their own agendas and have taken up the agenda of the Lord. Therefore, our time, our treasure, and our whole life is consumed in thy will be done. And that's the sweetest place to be. Can I get a witness? And for the Christian, your purpose is about making God big. And God moves in our lives when the goal, when your goal 
is his purpose. You can't lose because God's purposes will be fulfilled. That's why I like the fact that the Bible lets us know when this gospel of the kingdom has been going to the all, in, into all the world, the end will come. So I swallow up my life in sharing the gospel because I know that one day the last sermon is going to be preached. One day the last Bible study is going to be done. And when it's all over, God's going to come and take his children home. And I want to ask the church today, since we studied it in our Sabbath school lesson, is the mission of God huge to you? Or does it belong just to the Bible worker and the pastor? Are you purpose driven? Have you found the cause? Do, do, does your life align itself with God's purpose? And it doesn't matter what vocation you have. You can be a plumber. And on the job, you can plumb in Jesus' name and be a witness wherever you are. So wherever we are, whatever we're doing, we need to ask ourselves, can I be a witness? Because all of heaven is asking, can I get a witness? Is there somebody out there whose agenda is aligned with God's agenda? That's why the early Christian church was so powerful. That's why they experienced miracles. That's why they were able to direct divine power. That's why they were able to heal. That's why they were able to baptize. Because their agenda was swallowed up in God's agenda. And when our puny agendas are swallowed up in God's agenda. God can get his work done with power. We don't see that kind of power today because few of us are persecuted for righteousness. Sometimes we're persecuted and we deserve to be persecuted for our own foolishness. But you don't hear too many people going to jail because they were preaching the gospel. You don't hear too many people being persecuted because they were standing for Christ. And yet, those are the stories in the New Testament that God brought God's people closer to him. And where we see great things happening because when you do God's will and God's work in God's way, God's power will reveal itself. I'm afraid that many of us are not experiencing God showing up and showing out as the early church because we don't have the character that we should have. We have conformed into a cruise control discipleship and a GPS prayer life? Could it be that far too many of us have become comfortable, lukewarm Christians? Could it be that when we pray, we are not agonizing over anything that God remotely cares about, and consequently, he shelves your prayer on the side? Could it be that we have placed far too much emphasis on maintaining and preserving and policy and procedure? Then we have on action and advancement. What I'm trying to say is that God moves to the degree of our commitment to his purpose. If the goal is not doing something great for his cause, then why should we expect God to get involved? He is not interested in our ceremonious religiosity, but he will move in our midst when our goal is in line with his purpose, when our agenda is in line with his, and when his name is the only name that gets the credit. The Bible was not written for, 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 for the Bible was not written to be rewritten. It was written for us to obey God's word in the way that he prescribed. And so God moved in a very special way because he saw Joshua was a man of character who understood that the plan of God, that, the, that, that it is the plan of God to use the power of God through the people of God in order to accomplish the purpose of God. God moves when the goal is his purpose. But finally, we see in this story that God also moves when he finds people of great faith. If you look at verse 12, the Bible says, Joshua spoke to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel. And he said in the sight of all Israel, son, stand thou still. In the midst of the battle, Joshua achieves a military breakthrough. I'll tell you what's going on. He sees that if he just has a little more time, 
He can wipe them all out. He has so much faith that God has put him on a mission. And he says, listen, God, I can take care of this thing. What I need is a little more time. Son, stand thou still. Lord, give me more time. Now, if you look at him on a mountain by himself, isolated from all of that, it looks like presumption. To stand out in the sun and talk about sun, stand thou still. But in context, Joshua knows that he can wrap this thing up with God's power and God's help. And God has already demonstrated that he's on his side. And he wants to get the job done. And so he asks God to get involved in the battle. And God heard his prayer and made the sun to stand still. See, Hebrews chapter 2 lets us know that the gospel is preached. But because the word is not mixed with faith, it profits you nothing. In other words, if you hear great Bible stories and you're not encouraged and you don't apply the word to your life by faith, then hearing a good sermon and, and coming to church and singing these songs of faith will mean nothing. Unless you allow the word of God to make the change in your life by faith, this is a futile exercise. And it's clear. That many of us are failing in the spiritual warfare because we're not people of faith. We like to reason this thing out. And if it doesn't match our reasoning, therefore we can't do it. But how many of you know that the just have, have to live by faith? You see, some of us are so, we, we've heard enough sermons. It's not another sermon we need to hear. We are, we are educated and saturated and acculturated beyond the level of our obedience. So we don't need another sermon. Truth be told, the last thing we need is another sermon. Because as far as God is concerned, it doesn't matter that the gospel is preached, that the Bible is explained, that error is exposed, or truth is triumphed. If faith is not mixed with the word that you hear, it will do you nothing. And the sad fact is that there are people, perhaps today, who are listening to me right now, who are baptized in regular standing, who are not living lives that make a difference because they are, not, they are living by faith and by sight and not by faith. And so you will never reach your true potential as a Christian because we're not living by faith. So God encourages us through this sermon and through this, this uh, text today to have faith in God. And in Joshua, he finds a man of faith. Someone who can make the sun stand still. And I wonder, do you still believe that God is able? No, 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 let me bring it a little closer. Do you believe that God is able to address your situation? Do you believe that God is able to get in there with you and make a difference in your life? Can he handle your problem? I stopped by to tell you, that there is nothing better than having faith in God. For faith is that ray of hope in darkness. Faith is spiritual sight when the, our sight is denied. Faith is walking and knowing that God is walking with you. Faith is knowing that God, that what God said in his word is true. And that God will always act according to what he said. If you look at the incident by itself, it looks kind of presumptuous. But when you put the, it in proper context, you'll see that Joshua's request is rooted in God's word. His prayer is sugar-coated with God's promise. Joshua's bold declaration is in relationship to God's purpose. And whenever God gives his word, he will go to great lengths to make good on his promise. And he will use his unlimited resources to marshal his power in order to meet our needs and to achieve his divine purpose. One Christian writer has said, if you attempt great things for God, then you can expect great things from God. Joshua, when he shouted at the sun, 
stand thou still over Gibeon? I don't think he knew that the sun was 8,000 miles in diameter, 200 million square miles of surface area, traveling through space at a speed of 18 and a half uh, miles per second. When Joshua said, moon, stand over the valley of Agilon, he did not know that the sun was 93,000 miles from the earth and at its core, 30,000 Fahrenheit. He didn't know all of that. He didn't know all these scientific facts about the sun. So when he was speaking these words, he didn't know all the facts about the sun, but he knew his facts about God. He knew that God could do it. And you don't need to know all the facts about life. What you need to know is all the facts about God. You need to know that God is able. You need, to, you need to know that God can make a way out of no way. You need to know that God can split the Red Sea. You need to know that at his word, the heavens can be shut up. Can I get a witness? You can, need to know that the worlds were called into exist, existence by his word. Ravens were fed, fed prophets and slingshots killed 12 foot giants and rams were found in thickets and shouts tumbled strong walls and friends came out of graveyards and lions lied down like house dogs and muddy waters cleansed leprosy at his word. What does that mean for us? That there is nothing too hard for the Lord. How many of you know that God is able? Did he wake you up this morning? Did he start you on your way? Did he put a song in your heart? Weeping may endure for a night, but how many of you know that joy can come in the morning? You, your heart's been broken by some careless word that's been said about you. But if you know God's word, It'll sustain you through your trials and sustain you through your troubles and get you through your problems. And at his word, he can bring you through. What we need to do is stand on God's word. He's looking for people of character. He's looking for people who are willing to do what he's asked them to do. God is looking for people today who will be people of faith. And I wonder today if there's someone today who can agree with God. I got a situation that I can't handle. Try doctors, lawyers, preachers. Why don't you try Jesus? Because he's a way maker. He can open doors. He's a mind regulator. He's a heart fixer. He can pick you up when you're down. He can turn you around, place your feet on higher ground. He's all that and some. Do you know him today? Have you tried him? And for your situation today, God is available. He's not only available, but God is able. He's not only able, but God is willing. And he's willing to do it for you today. So with heads about and eyes closed. I wonder if there's someone here today who has a problem that you can't solve. A battle that you can't fight. A river that you can't cross. A situation that's taken you under. But today, you want to renew afresh your commitment to God. Your character is not what it should be. It's flawed. But by the grace of God, he can, he can give you a makeover. Don't be discouraged with your own performance. He's already performed God's will on your behalf and credits your account. Today, by grace, through faith, you may be outside of God's will, but today, as you hear his voice, you want to come inside the will of God and you want to be his child. You need God to move in your life in a special way. And I'm going to be bold enough to ask you to stand on your feet. Forget the person beside you or behind you. 
You're on the Jericho Road, room for just two, no more, no less, just Jesus and you. And I'm, I'm, call, I'm making an appeal today for somebody who needs God to move in their situation. To do something miraculous. To bring you closer to his will. Praise God for you who stand. I'm asking that God would speak to you in, in a way that he's never spoken to you before. Touch your heart in a way that you've never felt before. Guide your feet in a way that you've never been guided before. Hold your hand in a way that you've never been held before. Rock your soul in the midnight hour like you've never been rocked before. Give you a song in the midnight that you've never heard before. Give you a testimony that know that the world didn't give and the world can't take away. Give you a joy that drugs can't give you and sex can't give you. Nobody can do you like Jesus. When you're facing fire, he'll walk with you and you won't get burned. When you got to go through the river, he'll take you through and bring you out the other side. He'll make a way. His hand is not too short and his ear is not too heavy to hear your cry. Doors may be shut in your face, but today heaven's gates are open wide. People may have turned their backs on you, but God welcomes you with loving arms. He'll heal you. He'll deliver you. He'll change you. He'll transform you. He'll make your life over again. You need him like that? Anybody need God like that? Or maybe it doesn't hurt enough yet. Maybe you need some more trials. Maybe you need some more stuff to come your way. But let me tell you something. One day you'll get to the place where you realize, ain't my bank account, not my education, not my network, not my family, not my culture, not my tradition, not my location, not my situation. And you're all by yourself. That's the best place and that's where God wants you. When the situation is so overwhelming that you can't even pray, all you do is cry it out. Holy Ghost will take your moan and your groan. Fix that thing up. Put it in the language of heaven. Put it on God's desk and he'll make his agenda your agenda. Anyone else today? Not for form or fashion. I'm tired of playing church. Folks will close the church doors today. You'll go home by yourself. But I tell you this. If you take Jesus with you. If you take Jesus with you. And get back by yourself. You can have a party. Walking through the valley. Of the shadow of death. Because God is your shepherd. Nobody knows your name. He'll write your name in the book of life. And when you get to heaven, he'll give you a new name to help you forget all about your troubles. That's the kind of God he is. Can I get a witness in this place? Because he's able. How many of you know that he's able? I said he's able.